from the Gospel recorded by St. Luke. The Gospel recorded by St. Luke, first chapter, reading the 52nd and the 53rd verse. Gospel recorded by St. Luke, reading the 52nd and 53rd verse. He has toppled the mighty from their thrones and exalted the lowly. He has satisfied the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. He has toppled the mighty from their thrones and exalted the lowly. He has satisfied the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. Today, on this third Sunday of Advent, we turn our attention to the birth of Jesus. Notice I said today. Not back in October when stores started putting out Christmas bills. <laughs> Notice I said today. Not in early November when all the radio stations started playing Christmas music. <laughs> and notice that I said today. Not on Black Friday when everyone told you it was time to start Christmas shopping. <laughs> While the world wants to jump ahead, Advent teaches us to wait <clears throat> and to first reflect upon Jesus' return and the coming kingdom. <laughs> then we give consideration to his birth. And all the things that the world wants to jump ahead to, and each year they jump further and further ahead, all of these things may not be appropriate for a celebration of Christ's birth. I hope no one here gets into what our society and what our culture refers to as the Christmas spirit. <laughs> they tell us that Christmas is the season for giving. But I've told you before that there is no season for that. Amen. The basis of Christmas is this. God so loved the world that God gave. Anything that we give should be in response to what God has first given us. And there is no season to respond to God's giving. This idea that there's a certain season for giving comes from merchants who want you to go out and buy. <laughs> I hope no one is decorating in, in order to have Christmas spirit. <laughs> now I hear you asking, Pastor, what's wrong with decorating for Christmas? <laughs> well, I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with decorating. But what decorating has to do with is not the message of Christmas. Amen. Understand this. Everything that you put up, you eventually will take down. <laughs> that means whatever you put up is temporary. But the message of Christmas is eternal. You can't ever take that down. Amen. Let's remember something that I said first Sunday of Advent. I said that the Advent 
season, and the seasons of the Christian calendar are given to us by the church to teach us to order and center our lives around the life of Christ. In centering our lives around the life of Christ, we do not center ourselves around the calendar of the world. Following the Christian calendar and ordering our life around Christ will be difficult because it means that we are rejecting the standards of the world. Centering your life around the life of Christ means removing yourself from worldly and human standards. And this will be difficult because it will mean that you are going against the grain, so to speak. You're going against what everyone around you is doing. It will mean that you're making a dramatic change from what you have been doing all of your life. It will mean that you have made a radical change in your life. But isn't that what Christianity is? Christianity, following Christ, is making a radical change in your life. Putting down and rejecting the things of this world so that as it says in the second chapter of Colossians, we might set our minds on things above where Christ is seated on the right hand of God. This radical change of the Christian life, centering our life around the life of Christ, is a rejection of the world. And we're not doing that to be popular. In fact, the world might even hate you for the radical change that you have made in your life. And if you feel persecuted and hated because of the life that you now live in Christ, rejoice in that. Remember what Jesus told us in the 15th chapter of John? If the world hates you, understand that it hated me before you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. However, because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of it, the world hates you. Making this radical change, centering your life around the life of Christ, means that you have rejected the world. Jesus calls us out of the world to be his own. And doing that will not make us popular. Mm -hmm. Nor will people understand what we're doing. But we are called to lead a different life. Yes. A life centered around the life of Christ. Yeah. Yeah. Leaving a life centered around the life of Christ means that we have to live by a different standard. Mm -hmm. The standard that Jesus set for us is both radical and what we are not accustomed to. Yet, we have to learn to live by God's new standard and how to live by it. God's standard is not only radical, it is a complete reversal of how the world operates. So in order to live by God's standard, we've got to change both the way we think about things and how we live in this world. This new radical standard is given to us today in our scripture. In our scripture this morning, Mary goes to visit her cousin Elizabeth, who is also pregnant. When she enters Elizabeth's house, the baby in Elizabeth's womb leaps with joy. Amen. Elizabeth then begins to praise God and to say to Mary in verse 42, Blessed are you among women, and your child will be blessed. In verse 45, Elizabeth says to Mary, Blessed is she who believed that the Lord would fulfill what 
is spoken to her. Mary responds to Elizabeth in verse 46 by saying, My soul praises the greatness of the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, because he has looked, uh, he has looked with favor on the humble condition of his servant. Mm -hmm. Mary continues in, to give praise to God and says in the verse of our text, he has toppled the mighty from their thrones and exalted the lowly. He has satisfied the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. Yeah, right. Listen to that again. He has toppled the mighty from their thrones and exalted the lowly. He has satisfied the hungry with good things and set the rich away empty. Mm -hmm. Mary is giving praise to God because God is using her to topple the mighty and to exalt the lowly, yeah. to satisfy the hungry and to send the rich away empty. mighty, because of their power, usually sit on thrones and rule, and they rule according to their advantage, while everyone else suffers. And not only that, the rich, because of their wealth, usually get anything that they want, and common people, especially the poor, struggle to get by. But God is reversing the order. Amen. Amen. Notice again what it says. He has toppled the mighty from their thrones and exalted the Lord. He has satisfied the hungry with good things and <coughs> sent the rich away empty. What God does in the birth of Jesus is to reverse the order of society. God turns everything around. Those who are lowly are exalted, and those who are poor and hungry are satisfied. Yeah, right. and that's not how things generally work in society. Yeah. But Mary understands that that is what God is doing through this child. God is reversing the order. And in this child, God has come for the least of God's people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We see this in Jesus' birth. Where was Jesus born? In a private suite in the Jerusalem hospital? <laughs> was he celebrated by the elite of Jerusalem on his birth? Born in Bethlehem, town of working class people. In fact, he wasn't even born in Bethlehem. He was outside of Bethlehem in a stable. <laughs> the leaf of Jerusalem missed the whole thing. They didn't even know anything about it. The elite of Jerusalem didn't find out until about two or three years later when the Magi came to tell them. The child was born to a poor family among poor people. And when you read the Gospels carefully, you'll see that Jesus' ministry was among poor people to whom he satisfied, not just with food, with the gospel of peace. Oh, yeah. Amen. Amen. This is God's reversal of order. Right. To exalt the lowly, to satisfy the hungry. And this is why Mary is giving praise to God. She is one of those who are lowly, who God is now exalting. 
So exalted is she that she goes on to say in our scripture, surely from now on all generations will call me blessed. From her poor and lowly position, God has exalted her to be blessed and highly favored among women. This is God's reversal of order. And I suggest to you this morning that this is the true spirit of Christmas. Amen. To exalt the Lord and to satisfy those who are hungry. This is why the Christmas spirit is not temporary. The Christmas spirit isn't just for a season. The true spirit of Christmas is everlasting from generation to generation. I like the way William Barclay speaks about our text. He speaks about our text as two revolutions. There's a social revolution and an economic revolution. In terms of a social revolution, God comes to exalt the lowly, those who are marginalized, those whose society have forgotten, those who we often <coughs> ignore. It is to these people that God has come, not to the proud, not to those who have status and prestige, but to the lowly. And the, ex and the example of this is Jesus' own ministry. Think about who the people were who Jesus hung out with. We talked about the Pharisees and Sadducees last week. They were the people of status in that society. They were not only the religious leaders, they were also the people of authority. But Jesus didn't hang out with them. Jesus hung out with tax collectors, those who were most hated in society. And the biggest criticism of Jesus was this, that he ate with sinners. And that criticism came from the religious leaders. But remember, Jesus said that those who were well didn't need a position. He came for those who were both lost and those whose society had left behind. And if that was Jesus' mission, shouldn't that be our mission as well? I told you before, about my struggles with people who are on the street. And living most of my life in large cities has taught me that. A couple of weeks ago, I was in Chicago. And I was going, well, I was going to West Loop, but I, was, I stopped at the corner. And at the corner was a woman who, living on the street, she had all of her things around her. Stopped at the light, waiting to walk across the street. And as I was standing there, some guys came up and she called out to them. She wanted to know if the Bears had won the football game. Now, these guys had clearly gone to the game because they were there with all of their gear. They were wearing their jerseys and they had their Bears stuff. And they had clearly gone to the game. And she called out to ask if the Bears had won. And you know they did not respond. Mm -hmm. no, oh my they never paid her any attention. And, and I wanted to tell her myself, but I didn't know. In a restaurant and saw the first part of the game, but I didn't know how it had ended. I couldn't respond myself. And as soon as the light changed, they raced across the street, never giving the lady any attention at all. How cold some of us can be to others. But what we forget. That those who we ignore, 
those we step over and discount. Jesus came for them too. Yeah. Yeah. And what would our city be? If we who are the church and the followers of Jesus would seek not those with prestige, but those who are marginalized and those who our society has forgotten. What kind of church would we be if we had that as our mission? And not some of the other things that we do. After, after the social revolution, there's an economic revolution. He has satisfied the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. Our society is an acquisitive society. I, our economy is based on acquiring things. Every month we get a report on consumer confidence. That report is designed to show the spending patterns of people. If consumers are confident in the society, then consumers will spend. And if consumers are not confident in society, then they will not spend. And when the consumer confidence level is high, that means consumers are buying things. And when we buy things, the stock market goes up. Because the owners and the producers of things are making money. And when they make money, then we say the economy is doing well. <laughs> when the economy is doing well, that means that rich people are getting richer. <laughs> Have you ever noticed that nobody asks a person with two part-time jobs how well the economy is doing well? <laughs> Some of us with full-time jobs are just getting by. Amen. And even though we are just getting by, our society has taught us to spend. That's what we do. Notice, our society does not teach us to save. It teaches us to spend. We need the new this or the latest that. We have to upgrade to the latest model and nothing can last more than a couple of years because it's outdated. We bought model three, but after a couple of years we're not satisfied with that anymore because they're now on model six or seven. Eleven. <laughs> And don't let anything happen to Model 3 because they don't support that anymore. Yeah. When you go to the store, they'll tell you you have to upgrade to the new model. And when you upgrade, you find that the price is double from the last time that you bought something. Because we need the newest thing, we'll find a make a way to upgrade and get the latest whatever it is. That's what we do because this is what our society teaches us. But this is not the way of God. Let me remind you of what our prayer is. We pray this and we're taught to pray this. Give us this day our daily bread. This is our prayer, and when we pray that, what we're really saying to God is to give us not only what we need, to give us only, to give us only what we need for today. Not more than what we need, but only what we need. 
Do you know that if we actually followed what we prayed, we would bring an economic revolution in society? Oh, yeah. We don't need the latest, the newest, the biggest. We only need what is necessary for today. And when we pray that prayer, we're asking God to give us the faith to trust God to provide what we need for the day. When we trust God to provide for what we need, then we don't need to go to the mall. We can put our phones down and stop ordering online. We don't need all that stuff. That's right. And not only do we not need all that stuff, we violate our prayer because instead of trusting God for what we need, we're all trying to acquire things on our own. Amen. Amen. Now, if you look around my house, you'll find that I don't have a lot of things that I don't need. But what I do have is a lot of books. <laughs> However, if you ask me, I'll tell you that I need all of those books. <laughs> and I need them especially because I teach. I saw an article on CNN's website last night about a new book from the daughter of George Wallace. She's reflecting on her father and the changes that have happened in society and happened even in her own life. So you know I ordered the book, right? Of course. <laughs> I need that book because I teach a course on the Civil Rights Movement. And a book reflecting on George Wallace is pertinent to that course. And I'll teach you that course this January. But I won't have time to read the book for the course. So I need the book now so that I can have it when I teach the course two years from now. <laughs> and some of you might ask, well, why can't you wait two years and buy the book? But how do I know it's going to be in print two years from now? You got it at the library. No, I need to get it now, and then I'll have time to read it and, and retain the information from when I teach the course in two years. You see, we all need things that maybe we really don't need to know. Mm -hmm. We need to learn how to follow God's reversal of order and not be acquitted not try to acquire more than what we really need. We don't have to seek and to buy every new thing. Instead, we need to live, learn to live by our prayer. Give us this day our daily bread. Give us this day just what I need for today. because God has promised to provide for us everything that we need. Amen. 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 And if we were to, were to learn that economic revolution, you know what would happen? The rich would go away empty because they're not making any money anymore. <laughs> Follow the ways of the world. We don't need to follow the things that the world teaches us. God has a different way. Yeah. And God's way is to trust God and to rely on God for what we need. Yeah. To reach out to those who the rest of the world has forgotten. Those who we would normally ignore. Remembering that God first reached out to us. Out to others, 
trust God for what we need. <coughs> then we fulfill the true spirit of Christmas. Amen. Exalting the lowly, satisfying the hungry, and trusting and waiting on God for all that we truly 